And now for part four of my interview with CNN's foreign affairs correspondent, Jill Doherty. I want to go back to this issue of women in the media, because in January 2010, Diane Sawyer will take over and be anchoring the nightly news on ABC World right. News. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's terrific. I really think it's terrific. She's a wonderful journalist. She has a wonderful way on air. And it will be a test, you know? Will people um, think of her just in the way that they think of a man, which is, here's the news, you know, coming from a person who knows? But I also think that, as I said before, that the, the media are changing. And so the importance of a big nightly newscast is not as great as it used to be, especially among younger people. And do you think that overall the coverage of women newscasters, whether it be Katie Couric, whether it be Diane Sawyer, or even political figures like a Hillary Clinton, do you think that we have balanced and fair coverage when it comes to women in those positions of power? You mean covering them? Or? Yes, covering them, exactly. Oh, uh, <laughs> what can I say? I mean, it's so star-driven that it's very hard to even penetrate, you know, the, the coverage, the, the coverage, let's say, of what Katie Couric is up to or what Dan, Diane Sawyer. I still think there's a tinge of that, you know, women and, and what they look like and how they act. And uh, I even saw the phrase cat fight right. in a, on a story about this. I mean, let's get real, <laughs> you know? Would they say that about a man? Well, right. Anytime two women disagree, it's suddenly a cat fight. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's idiotic. Well, I think one example that comes to mind is Hillary Clinton's recent trip to Africa, which substantively was a fascinating trip where she really made real progress in dealing with some of the great issues of our day. Yet the news media, when covering the trip, was much more interested in what she had to say about Bill Clinton than anything else about the trip. Right, right. Well, the, and, and also, that was a trip that had, as you said, very important international aspects to it. And the approach that this State Department is taking goes into areas, especially like women's issues, women's rights, et cetera, that are not traditional areas for the State Department to cover. I mean, they, they do get into that, of course, but they're not considered the hard, driving international policy issues. So uh, Secretary Clinton, I think, sometimes comes off looking as if she is not being directly involved in the really heavy-duty, heavy-lifting international issues. But her priorities are very much in that area, women's rights, families. And always have families. been. Always have right. been. I mean, I covered her at, this, at the White House going back, you know, Clinton won. And it was what she was interested in, and she's been interested in it for years. What do you think um, is going to happen to her in terms of her political future? <laughs> That's a good question for a New York correspondent. <laughs> I don't know. If she stays at the State Department, we'll just have to see if her, if her voice is heard and, and what kind of uh, you know, an impact she makes on foreign policy. And, uh, but she's still could go back into politics. I want to talk a little bit about personal challenges that you had to face, because 10 years ago you were diagnosed with breast cancer. Right. Can you take me back to what that moment was like when you first got the diagnosis? You know, it happened in Russia. It was kind of a strange experience. Speaking about Chechnya, I, I wasn't feeling very well, and I knew something was going wrong. And I, I, I didn't know exactly what it was. And I went to Chechnya. And I saw a woman, I don't think I'll ever forget this, they were refugees, and this woman with her family was living in a bus. <laughs> and she had cancer. She had cancer on her leg, which I didn't even know really happened. And I looked at her, and I was very disturbed by it. And I had been thinking about going to the doctor, but I had too much to do. Mm -hmm. I had to read the paper, I had to check the internet, I had, you know, there were all sorts of things that I had to do except go to the doctor. So when I got back to Moscow, I went to the doctor, and we did the testing. We actually did a mammogram, and they said it was normal. And I brought it back to the doctor, who was a Frenchman, and he said, I do not think so. Why did you bring it back to the doctor? You said you weren't feeling well. Were there certain symptoms that you had? Yeah, I was tired. I had an ache in my breast, and I just, um, my hair was getting kind of brittle and thin, 
And I felt, I just knew, you know when your body tells mm -hmm. you something? I'm not very good at listening to my body, but I kind of tell it well, what to do. Well, in this case, you were, because you heard something yeah, and you listened to it. Yeah, I just knew it. something wasn't right. And then, then he said, I think you ought to go back to the States, go to a doctor. And we did an ultrasound, and there it was. You could actually see it on an ultrasound. So I think that's another message that I learned. Um, if you, if you get mammograms, and I'm a big proponent of mammograms, but sometimes they don't catch everything. So if you have a doubt, my advice would be, if you have a feeling, a hunch, an intuition that something's not wrong, right, that you follow it up. That's, and you go to the doctor. Exactly, and that's a very important message, obviously, we can give to people who are watching this. I know when I get my mammograms, I get the ultrasound and the mammogram, and I always feel, rightly or wrongly, a little bit safer walking out of there knowing that I had both. Yes, absolutely. So I think it's very important. Now, in terms of the treatment, how was it being on camera and on air and having to, in, in more of a public sense than so most people have to, deal with cancer? Yes, well, that was a little weird. Because when you, I had to have... Uh, surgery, uh, chemotherapy, and radiation, and I lost all my hair. So I did actually cover the Russian election with a wig. I came back for treatment, and then I went back to Russia and covered the, um, the election. It was winter, and um, I was actually glad I had a wig. But you look different. I mean, you know, no eyebrows. <laughs> that changes your look. So um, you feel a little vulnerable. And what I didn't want to do I wanted to be absolutely open about what was going on. But I, sometimes I thought, do I really want to let people into my private life that much? You know? And then do you get, I don't know, defined as the, the reporter who had cancer? Right. You know, it cuts both ways. But I just thought, it's what I'm going through. There are a lot of women who are going through it. And I might as well just you know, be honest about it. Now you said that you felt vulnerable. What do you mean by that? I felt physically vulnerable. Number one, because when you get cancer and you don't smoke, don't drink, jog like a maniac, work out in gyms, and think you're invinci invincible, and then all of a sudden you find you have cancer, it rocks your world. I couldn't, it, it just didn't compute. Like, how did this happen to me? And then all of a sudden I thought, you know, what does this mean? You think about your mortality. I mean, will I be around next year? It's, it's heavy duty, you know? emotionally, psychologically. And then also, in my career, which is out there in a public sense, I didn't want to be defined as the reporter who had cancer, or uh, so that that would be the only focus on who I was. Now, in a recent interview, you recalled that once your hair started falling out, you realized that you wanted to be authentic, even on TV. Tell me about this idea of being authentic. <laughs> Well, you know, when you work in TV, it's very hard to be authentic because you, there's this whole thing. You know, you work in TV, and there are predictable things, and it's, it's a very, it can be a very superficial medium. TV can be very superficial, um, as if that's any surprise. <laughs> uh, so to really be yourself or to do things that are unpredictable, I mean, I, I just can't believe how you can be straightjacketed. And I can straightjacket myself into thinking I ought to do things because I'm in TV. But when I went out, you know, I guess physically, let's start with that. Um, should I, I, do, I colored my hair, I must admit, under the influence of my mother, who said, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too sure that I can deal with a daughter who has gray hair when <laughs> I don't even have gray hair, because she's a blonde. But so I colored my hair for a couple of years or whatever, and then I thought, you know, th this is not me. So when I lost my hair and it all came back, I loved it because it was kind of spiky gray, and I thought, this is very cool. And then, of course, I had to decide, do I color it, do I not? And I decided to go with it the way it was. And there's something very liberating about it. It's just like, this is the way it is. I don't color it, get used to it, like it or lump it. And that's, right. you know? What was the reaction? Uh, people actually liked it. I'm sure I mean, women in particular, particularly those who have either gone through cancer or had loved ones who have cancer, have really reacted positively to it. Oh, yeah, definitely. There, yeah, there are people who, I've actually had people come up to me on the street and say that, you know, um, or remember, you know, that I went through cancer. 
Now, when you were talking about when you got the diagnosis and you mentioned the woman that you saw in Chechnya who had cancer on her leg, did you ever find that because you do see such suffering worldwide that many people, frankly, don't see on a daily basis, did it make you more able to process having cancer yourself? Or conversely, did it make you look at it, your diagnosis in a different light? You know, I think that um, this sounds so weird, but it gave me more compassion. Because before, I can honestly say, because I'm quite disciplined, and I, as I said, I run, you know, I have a careful diet, and I thought, if you did that, that you were guaranteed good health. And then all of a sudden I found out that's not true. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes people fall over a cliff or get hit by a car or get a disease or something happens. And then your world is not what you predicted. So all of a sudden I looked around at people and I, 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 it's embarrassing, but I used to look at people and think, you know, if they were just out there jogging, they wouldn't have that problem. Or if they were eating right, you know, what's their problem? Just shape up and ship out or ship out. And, and then I looked around and I thought, hmm, maybe that person can't help that. So it humanized you in it a sense and makes yeah. you realize that life is unfortunately random, that we can't control everything. Exactly.